you know, if you think about like what a symbol is, right? Like, in, like Adolf Hitler it was a person. He was a leader of Germany, you know, in the 30s and 40s. To us, what he is, is he's a symbol, right? The Holocaust is a symbol, but, you know, just like the cross and God and the devil, whatever their external reality and, and grounding in the in the real world, to us, they're symbols. Like that's how they, you know, how they activate for us. And so like, like what does that mean? Like a symbol is like an image that is implanted like deep in our subconscious by the culture at a very early age that is attached to and meant to activate like a whole constellation of feelings and emotions and reactions and responses, you know? And every society, this is how societies bind themselves together. They use symbols to do it, right? Like um, when you see people get super, super angry and worked up over somebody desecrating the flag, part of that is because that symbols lodged in there and, you know, all of those hostile responses are sort of, that's what's meant to be evoked by, by something like that. But also it's because on some, on some ground level, like people have some idea, even if they're not, they're not thinking about it consciously, that if we start, that if everybody starts kind of moving to a place where we don't care that the flag is being desecrated, that some, we're going to come apart in certain ways. Certain things are going to come apart that we all sort of rely on, even if that's not like really elucidated, you know, clearly in people's minds. And I think that when you look at World War II, I mean, it's very much like that. Like people have this, I mean, from a very, very early age, you know, at literally elementary school, like it is put in your head that this is different. This is not really a historical event. This is a, this is a sort of world historical mythological event. And, and, and I don't say myth to mean that it's false or a lie, but I, in this symbolic sense, right, that, that it plays in the culture. Um, like it's a, like I told Tom yesterday, like it's a, it's a load bearing story, right? There's a right. lot that rests on this particular story being just in this way. And even if people, you know, don't have, uh, even if they're not if, if, if sort of uh, breaking this down to themselves, like consciously in their minds, like they have an idea that if we start to question this particular story, if we start to pick it apart and look at it critically because symbols, you know, symbols never hold up to like endless critical analysis. I mean, that's one of the problems like that we run into in post-modernity, right? You can uh, do that with everything. And so I, I'm not like saying these things are bad, they're necessary. Um, but you know, you have to look at the functions that they're actually serving. And if you look at the functions that the World War II myth has at least, you know, has come to serve, um, surely some things, you know, um, are solid. It, it, it definitely ingrained in the Western world, like in people from a very early age in a way that was probably never possible before, a sort of visceral reaction against uh, group hatred based on, you know, race and things like that. You know, it's, it, I mean, when you really think about like people today and people, if you just go back any time in human history, 300 years ago, like the level of just innate tolerance in your average America, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's truly unbelievable that that transformation didn't happen over centuries. It happened really over the course of a generation or two. And the World War II story being so central to, you know, the, the order we're living in is a big part of that, you know? And so that's good. That's great. Um, but then also, you know, uh, World War II has been used to essentially justify the U.S global order, the U.S. empire, if you want to call it that. Um, it's been used to sort of justify the special status and privileges that are accorded to the state of Israel, that sort of place it above uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the critical um, evaluation and standards that we would expect above Western democratic nations, things like that. Um, and even you mentioned democracy, like uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe. You know, democracy is one of those symbols too, and that's why people yeah. got triggered when they read that book. Is that symbol was triggered, and a cascade of emotions and everything else just overwhelmed the fact that he was, you know, everything else he said. And uh, democracy is one of those things. Like you can't even question. I mean, questioning democracy is like that's a that's a big project. I think you got to be very careful with that because whenever you overthrow the entire order of a society, that can go in unpredictable and dangerous ways. And, you know, the people who uh, maybe have great reasons for wanting it overthrown all, don't always get their way. In fact, they usually don't. And so we have to be very careful with like the, the, the larger idea. 
but you really like it's not something that's even questionable like democracy is a religious precept you know and so and so so much really rests on that story in a way that it doesn't with world war one or the korean war or the vietnam war or anything like that all those other wars they had this like ramp up of emotional attachment where you know you better not be against the Iraq war in 2003, you know, or else you're just an unpatriotic American and, you know, uh, David Frum's gonna, gonna, gonna write you out of the conservative movement and everything else. Right. But then it kind of passes and it, you know, that power, that cultural power kind of fades away. And that's how all the other conflicts work. World war II has been with us for 80 years and it's really still at that, at that peak, you know, yeah, it, it's such a good way to put it, man. That's it's because really what it is, just like as you as you say that, I'm thinking it's like yes, <clears throat> Iraq War II was, uh, it was a myth, but it wasn't a load bearing myth. There wasn't that much on top of it, so you could take that away, and essentially you still have the same narrative about the the, the fundamentals of who we are, of what our systems are. The only other one, really, right? And and of course, it's the only other war that could generate this type of uh, controversy would be the Civil War if you were on the South side. Like if you, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So I was going to say I would also add the Civil Rights Movement, and it's interesting yes. because the way, especially the left, but really everybody kind of talks and thinks about it, is that the Civil War, World War II, and the Civil Rights Movement, it's really all one long war. Like right. that's how they. It, you know what I mean? It's been like the forces of tolerance and good and democracy against the forces of oppression and uh, intolerance and racism and so forth on the other side. And they, they really do look at it like that, you know, that uh, it, it, that it's all been one long war in this in this sort of binary monarchy and sense. No, that's right. You know, there was a um, one one of your episodes that I really loved was uh, on on the history of um, tensions between uh blacks and Jews. And one of the points you made there and, and kind of, I think this is such a useful way to understand things as these like myths, again, to your point, not saying that they didn't really happen, just saying how they become myths in our lives and what purpose that serves. But you pointed out, um, how really the sixties more so than, you know, <clears throat> 1776 or 1865 or anything like the sixties are really the center of the modern, like, origin story and the example you just used was you said uh you know go desecrate um a statue of of george washington and then go desecrate a statue of martin luther king and tell me which one gets you more problems you know like tell me which one gets more of a a, a hysterical outrage and obviously we all know what the answer is to that but it's really it's it's very interesting because if you look at those three which as you point out are all kind of seen as one but if you look at the um the civil war and the abolition of slavery um, the Second World War and the Civil Rights Movement. And, and you realize that those really are the load-bearing myths. Those are the ones that you're still not allowed to question or people get very outraged. And then you kind of understand that, and, and look, to give the devil his due, I will say that, I, as you kind of said too, I, I do think like, hey, listen, if the regime, the US empire has anything it can brag about, it's that. Whether you agree with the means by which they did it, or whether you want to question who everybody was, you know, not a perfect angel, but okay, like, there used to be slavery, there isn't anymore. There used to be a belief in the deep south that black people were essentially animals who didn't deserve rights. That doesn't exist anymore. And as you pointed out, the kind of just accepted um, idea that you could very harshly judge another group based on immutable characteristics is at an all-time low. Or maybe it's backtracked a little in the last 10 years, but it's close to an all-time low. But then you think about the fact that everyone in the regime, whenever somebody is an enemy of the regime, they're always some form of racist or Nazi. And you recognize that you're like, oh, yeah, that's really <clears throat> – see, that's that's the only thing the regime can really brag about is that we beat the racists and the Nazis. They haven't put up a W since then. And so now every villain has to be one of those two things. You're either a racist or a Nazi. It, it's all kind of perfectly works out. Yeah, I mean, and those are the the prime evils of 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 the of this 
regime, right? And and again, to, to point that out is not to say that they're not evils. It's just, you know, in our society, uh, you know, people, um, and, and I'm sorry, you had to answer for this on Piers Morgan, but <laughs> put out, uh, I put out the, a tweet right after the Paris Olympic ceremony at the, you know, the, the Last Supper thing, where I posted a picture of Hitler and his boys walking in front of the Eiffel Tower, and I posted a picture of that Last Supper desecration. And I, uh, you know, I said that the the outcome of uh, the picture on the right was preferable to the one on the left or something like that, which, um, you know, I took down after a few people who I trust to tell me when I'm out of bounds, like, you know, let me know uh, that, 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 that they thought I was. But, you know, I told them, like, the reason that I did that is I was, like, outraged by what I was watching at the Paris Olympics. And I was reaching for the most extreme example possible to show my out to express my outrage about this and in our society it's not the devil you know if i would have posted a picture of satan like looming over the eiffel tower and said that this is better than that nobody would even got it you know it, it just it wouldn't have landed at all because hitler's the devil and the nazis are the legions of hell and you know in in germany like that's it every society has a heaven and hell every right. society has a god and a devil and, you know, and, and they don't have to think of it that way. They don't necessarily like it, it may be in totally, totally different terms. It may be in secular terms. It may be in mythological terms that divide up God into many and devil, you know, the devil into many evil spirit, whatever it is. But we've all got those. Like, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a basic structure of the human mind. And in our society, you know, that's like it's one of the reasons I'm, you know, I'm really convinced that, like, you know, there, there, there's always been just just as there's a you know, like, like an extreme focus and fascination with uh, with that, with World War II and the Holocaust on the side of, you know, you, you have to treat it as this sacred thing and treat it differently from everything else and, and don't be critical about it. Um, there's also, you know, on the other side, there's always just been this like undercurrent somewhere, even if it's just, you know, a, a punk rock thing or today it's like a an online thing or whatever of, like of positive fascination with Hitler and the Nazis. And I like my way of looking at that is every generation has its devil worshipers, you know, and not all of them are serious. Like the people who would say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a Satanist. A lot of times they're just trolls or whatever, but the devil is always going to attract a certain amount of attention from both directions, you know? And, um, and so when you, when you take a historical event like that and elevate it to that level and make it a myth, you're always going to have like, two sides of that, you know, two extreme reactions to, you know, to doing that. 